Europe has a much deeper integration already with Europe, uh, with, with the UK, and including the free movement of labour as well as uh, free trade. And uh, so we're very lucky to have with us this evening Bill Cash in to tell us where we should strike the balance in our relationship. Thank you. Okay. I like the word strike the balance. Right. Um, <clears throat> Well, um, I'm very really honoured to be asked to uh, make this presentation, and I hope just to add that uh, I'm sorry Janet Henry <coughs> from HSBC not able to be here, but uh, she and I have had a few words, <coughs> and she's lost her voice altogether, and it sounds as if mine's a bit croaky at the moment, so forgive me. I would like more yeah. if I could just have some. Thank you very much indeed. Um, basically, um, I'm going to ask, well, first of all, I'll just say who I am, because um, I was elected as chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee a couple of years ago, having led the rebellion against the Maastricht Treaty. So, um, and I was unanimously elected in the House of Commons um, a few years ago, two, two, nearly three years ago now. Uh, you can see the contrast between uh, opposing John Major's government over the Maastricht Treaty and now being elected uh, as the chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee, which is our select committee which examines all a thousand documents a year and I therefore also have to go to what's called COSAC. Does anybody know in this room what COSAC means? Right. Well, COSAC is the, actually the uh, 20, now 28 chairman of the National Parliamentary Committees. And we meet quite regularly actually uh, to discuss matters of uh, mutual interest and concern. And uh, not unnaturally, um, we had one last week um, in Dublin, and um, the issue which was at the top of the agenda really was democratic legitimacy, because there are very serious problems about this in Europe, and there's no point in getting away from it. And I, I led the debate, I was asked by the Irish presidency to lead the debate on the importance of national parliaments. And uh, in a nutshell, the whole thing is just a mess of contradictions. On the one hand, we are uh, extremely uh, concerned to preserve our democracy. On the other hand, the reality is that they talk about national parliaments and their sovereignty, and the Lisbon Treaty was supposed to have added to that. But in practice, the European Union, the European Commission, Barroso's blueprint, which you may or may not know about, uh, actually sort of says, well, we like the idea of national parliaments, but as a matter of fact, uh, the EU parliament is the only parliament for the uh, European Union. And uh, frankly, from a British point of view, you can forget it. Because that is not the position, and that's not what um, David Cameron said at all in the Bloomberg speech. And I don't have a habit of agreeing with prime ministers or disagreeing with them. I just form my own judgment. And basically, he's right. The fourth principle, which is that the root of national parliaments is that our national democracy is the key to peace and prosperity and indeed to trade. Um, I have a little bit of uh, anecdote to, uh, anecdotal history to give you, which is that I believe the first ever free trade agreement in the world was negotiated by John Bright, who was my great grandfather's cousin. In fact, it was negotiated by Colton. But it was Bright's idea, and through Chevalier in 1860, the French Commercial Agreement <coughs> <coughs> Treaty was entered into. And that was really a groundbreaking operation. But of course it was intimately associated with the idea of freedom of choice. And freedom of choice is at the essence of the dem democratic system. So the way I try to put it is this, that you have an apex which is called freedom. And at the top of that freedom, you then move down to freedom of choice. And below that, you move from freedom of choice in the marketplace, which is economics, and freedom of choice in the ballot box, which is democracy. And if you don't have a symmetry between these, um, you end up with some very strange results. And the European Union, unfortunately, um, has uh, become thoroughly undemocratic. And we in the United Kingdom are not impressed and I don't need to go into the details of the Eurobarometer um, polls which came out over the last month or so. It's the same throughout the whole of Europe. 
all the countries are equally worried about it. Now, you were mentioning about the G8, you know, sir, and uh, uh, how you had this photograph, which unfortunately, without craning my neck, I wasn't able to see, um, and how he was having lunch with the others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being there. We are. Well, there he is. Well, I was having lunch with him today, and I was sitting next to him, um, uh, and we discussed some of these matters, not in relation to this meeting, but in relation to the EU US free, uh, trade agreement. Because um, as chairman of the European Committee, my concern, inevitably and rightly, is to have regard to what is in UK interests. And um, the bottom line on that in relation to this agreement is that on Friday last week, uh, the uh, European Foreign Affairs Council agreed the framework for the negotiations on the, the negotiated mandate. However, <clears throat> we don't know anything in the British Parliament about what it contains. And so I got up today, this afternoon, uh, because the Prime Minister has a responsibility under our uh, constitutional arrangements to report to Parliament uh, on the outcome of the summit. He has to do this whenever there is an EU summit. And uh, <clears throat> I, as Chairman of the European Committee, asked him directly, uh, given the fact that the United Kingdom uh, has only 12% of the votes, and that's only gone up recently from 8%, and that the whole question of these free trade agreements, uh, which in principle you can understand, not only given my historic background, but also my conviction in favor of liberalization, in favor of all the things that you mentioned, uh, which is freedom of choice, the ability to be able to engage in free trade, to reduce tariffs, to free up services, to free up trade, and the rest. But the question is whether, in fact, this is what's going to happen under these arrangements. And that is a very big issue. And you only have to, as you quite rightly said, Minister, refer back to the Doha to see the difficulties. But if the thing becomes an ideology and it doesn't work, then, in fact, things might get very sticky indeed. And uh, I therefore asked him, in the light of the fact that we only have 12% of the votes, and that the whole of these arrangements is conducted under the framework of qualified majority vote, and the fact that it's an exclusive competence of the European Union, and the fact that the European Commission has, under this mandate, and indeed under the Lisbon and other treaties, being given the right to be able to decide these questions in terms of the framework on behalf of the whole of the EU, given the very, very great importance of this, and I entirely share your, your interest in this because you're saying this is hugely, it's very, very um, significant, the question is whether it's necessarily going to produce what you describe towards the end as equality and mutual benefit. Now, you can see if I may just refer respectfully to the situation in Japan, an island, um, uh, a country which uh, has its own sovereignty and uh, would not for a moment uh, believe that it would be in the interests of Japan, I suspect, unless you tell me to the contrary, uh, to enter into a deal uh, whereby you subordinated all your trading interests to China, Korea, countries in Southeast Asia, and you found yourself effectively in Japan having these decisions decided by qualified majority vote. I have to say that I put this in, to the Americans in the past at conferences I've taken part in, and I've said, how would you uh, react if you're trading? Bear in mind, 350, 400 years, we in the United Kingdom have been trading successfully, and I was very grateful to you for your comments about our interest in liberalization. In the, in, in the contribution that the United Kingdom makes now and has made to uh, trading throughout the world, whether it's in services or in trade or in goods, although our manufacturing has gone down, uh, that's been the result of some very big mistakes that have been made, I believe, in our economic policy, much of which derived from our having engaged in uh, the European Community Act 1972, which, by the way, I voted for in 1975, I, I was in favor of the referendum. I said yes, 
And I said yes to the Single European Act. And I don't know whether I'm telling you something that you don't know about, because I just I assume in these audiences that there are so many distinguished people, both from the trading relationships, the trade, trading background, and also academic, that you know what the Single European Act actually said. Well, I was party, party to it in the sense that I was there in the House of Commons and I wrote articles about it at the time, I discussed it with Margaret Thatcher and uh, you may not be interested to know it took her four minutes to decide to sign that treaty. She stood there and kept them waiting because she wasn't absolutely certain and I can tell you for a fact that she told me afterwards she made a mistake and she shouldn't have done it. So um, this is quite sensitive territory and the question uh, that is before us, if I cross it right, is uh, really what is the benefit of uh, relationships between neighbours? We actually did quite well in the last hundred years in terms of ensuring peace and stability uh, in Europe and we now find ourselves uh, against this background of these incredibly important matters, finding that we, and I'm now talking about the coalition government and the Lisbon Treaty, which is the previous Labour government, actually having entered into arrangements creating an exclusive competence for the EU at the expense of our bilateral trading relationships with all other countries in the world by law, and at the same time that we only have 12% of the negotiating stakes that the Germans, if I may say so, have the most enormous advantage because they have alliances based on their trade balance, which I'll mention in a moment, in relation to the whole of the European Union. And anyone, I mean, I was writing about this in 1990. I wrote a book called Against the Federal Europe because it was my judgment at the time that it would lead to riots, unemployment, and to the rise of the far right. And furthermore, that monetary union was not a real runner now, I'll leave that for you to judge, but the, what I said in 1990, to a certain extent, um, was based on a historical and political judgment. Uh, I'm not an economist, but I don't think there are many people who would, uh, <clears throat> and there's certainly none in Parliament at the moment, who dare get up and say, well, actually, uh, everything that was done uh, under the aegis of the treaties up to and including the Lisbon Treaty has been a success. Not from a British point of view, it has not. Uh, I'll give you some figures as to why. So basically, there is this argument which we have to grapple with. And so I put it to the Prime Minister, we want in the European Scrutiny Committee to be able to see the terms of the negotiated man 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 mandate. It's been agreed, but we're not allowed to see it. Now isn't that a bit odd in an open democracy? that you don't know what is being negotiated until the, the negotiations are concluded. And it's a really quite a serious democratic question, because as you quite rightly said, Minister, it is going to have the most enormous impact. And if equality and mutual benefit, to use your expression, are to be seen as the test, tests of it, then we want to be sure that it's in our interests. Are we going to be outvoted when it comes to these particular sectors? Are we going to be... And when the Single European Act was going through, which I say I voted for, I put down an amendment. And that amendment said, nothing in this Act of Parliament shall affect the sovereignty of the United Kingdom Parliament. Because it wasn't that I didn't want it to happen, because I am a free trader, I do want to see it happen. What I asked was, if it doesn't work, is it in fact going to be such a good deal? And are we going to be able to reserve our position in relation to the treaties and the U European uh, legislation? so as to preserve our right to be able to make any adjustments later. And that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, and I'll tell you why it's become important. One of the reasons I am uncertain, you notice I'm not saying I'm against it, the EU uh, deal, with the US, or with Japan, or with Korea, or with Peru, all these others, I'm watching them all, and I'm setting up an investigation through my Europe committee, and I talked today with the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Richard Ottaway, and he said, we've got, we, oh, yes, but you're absolutely right, we need to look at this. And I know that that will be the same reaction in the uh, select committee which deals with uh, the biz, you know, uh, business or whatever they call themselves, the biz cable outfit. 
<laughs> but uh, the, the point I make is this, that these are hugely important matters and we want to get them right. And I also believe that if it goes wrong for Europe, it will go wrong for all the other countries in Europe as well. And as I said, there is one dominant country at the moment, and I think it's going to remain that way. And, um, you know, those of you who are familiar with uh, Wolfgang Munchau's articles, uh, who says he's a, a fanatical European, but at the same time he talks an awful lot of sense, uh, which indicates that he's got serious worries. Anatoly Kolecki, I mean, Roger Buchel, I mean, Tim Congdon, maybe you think uh, he's a little bit to the right, but I can only say this, when you add up, the people who really got an enormous amount of experience of these things, and you tot it up. Um, there are, Ruth Lee is not to be a, a underestimated, you know what I mean? The Institute of Directors, all these different organizations, some of whom do not know a great deal about the actual mechanics of, and the nuts and bolts of, the negotiated mandate, which is why the Prime Minister answered me, just in case you want to know what the answer was, uh, that he was going to help me to get the information which I demanded on behalf of the European Scrutiny Committee. And by the way, the European Scrutiny Committee is an all-party committee, and it is also uh, it was established in 1972 on our entry into the European Union and of course the European Community in those days. And um, the our terms of reference are to not only examine every single document which is why I want this, these uh, mandated, uh, uh, these ma this mandate. But in addition to that, um, also to uh, report to the House of Commons, I have the biggest staff in the House of Commons of all the select committees. I have legal advisors, I have uh, specialist advisors in trade, agriculture, all the sectors which mirror each government department. And they report to the committee every week on these thousand documents divided up into their respective sectors and it's then for us in the light of the advice that we've received then to form a judgment about whether or not this should be debated in the House of Commons. We don't have the right to be able to veto but we do have the right to insist that before the government enters into an agreement on any directive or regulation that the matter is debated in the House of Commons. So there is a, what's called a scrutiny reserve. And at the moment, I've set up uh, a com an inquiry into European scrutiny. So we're examining ourselves at the moment, and we've taken evidence from other countries throughout Europe, and we are looking at the whole question of the efficacy of scrutiny in reality as compared to the theory. <coughs> we, we do a good job, I know we do. The problem is that people outside, I mean, let me ask you another question. How many people in this room have ever looked at the European scrutiny um, document I mean, any, on any of our reports? I'm a student, so I have to do one thought. <laughs> bad luck. <laughs> <bad, bad, bad. laughs> but you appreciate, if you look at the explanatory memorandum for every single document, you know what I'm talking about, because the government is under an obligation, under the standing orders of Parliament, to report <clears throat> on its policy. It's too late, quite often, but the idea that the European Parliament can do the job we do for the sake of the British people is just nonsense, because they can't and they don't want to, because they have a completely different objective. Their objective is political union, not to safeguard the interests of the voters of the United, and the businesses of the United Kingdom. So we have a legitimate role to play. Um, and what I will say is this, that, um, and I'll now give you the reasons for my concern. Not only, but I, I, I leave you to uh, consider the whole question of um, the, the state of the play. We're on Friday we're going to have this referendum bill. You, you, you know all about what's going on in relation to the attitudes in the Eurobarometer Trust and the state of opinion polls in the United Kingdom. This is not happening by chance, and it's not happening because the Daily Mail happens to take a view which is not 100 miles from my view, or the Daily Telegraph. You've got Jagan, Janan, uh, your friend uh, Ganesh, in today's uh, <coughs> Financial Times, writing an extremely interesting article in which he says the Labour Party is also beginning to blink. 
And incidentally, I know, because obviously I've been in Parliament 30 years, that, um, and I've been on the European Committee for 28 of those years, uh, that there are shifts going on inside Parliament as a whole. So the things are complementing one another. And when things like that happen, they don't happen because, though the BBC, for example, might like to say it's it's a lot of ranting, swivel-eyed uh, um, Eurosceptics, or if they didn't say it, somebody else would say it. The fact is, it's nothing of the kind. It's an evaluation. And I want to give you some figures just before I go any further. Please don't misinterpret me. We, we have a genuine interest, as Japan for its own people has a genuine interest in making sure all this works properly. We do not, we want free trade, we want liberalisation, and I'm extremely grateful, if I may say, for the manner in which you address that question, because both historically and for the re freedom reasons I gave at the beginning, this is incredibly important to the rest, rest of the world. But if it goes wrong, or if it's concentrated too much in the wrong hands, you get the equivalent of kind of monopoly or a cartel or something or other that can go wrong which will distort the trade rather than to free it up because there are some very powerful protectionist interests and the EU has a tendency to move in that direction so we have to watch that one as well. Let me just give you the figures I keep on half referring to and haven't yet given you. Um, the trading um, let's take current account transactions, goods and services, imports, exports. Well, we all agree that that's quite a good parameter against which to judge the relative merits of trading between nations. If you were to get these figures, and I've got them, not only between the United Kingdom and the other 27 member states, but every other country and the other 27 or 28 now. So I've got these figures from the ONS and from other sources. And I've also got them between the UK and uh, the Commonwealth, and all the other countries of the Commonwealth between themselves. So it's, it's rather a maze, and it's quite difficult to remain completely um, clear-headed when you're going through all these figures. But just to focus on the current account transactions, imports, exports, uh, goods and services, in 2011, the British trade deficit with the other 27 was 47 billion pounds. Now, that's a lot of money to be running, if I can use it rather a, a non-economist language, running a loss on your trading with the other 27, 47 billion. Um, one year later, 2012, and these figures came out about six weeks ago, the figure had risen from a loss of 47 billion or minus 47 billion to 70 billion in one year. Now that's quite a big jump. You're much better qualified to look at these figures, I'm sure, than I am. Germany, on the other hand, had a surplus of 30 billion in relation to uh, the same figures between Germany and the other 27, of 30 billion in 2011. By the end of 2012, it had gone up to plus 70 billion, or 72 billion actually. So you can see, and I discussed this with the chairman of the uh, German uh, European Select Committee, that really, you know, there's something seriously wrong. This is not equality and mutual benefit, which I come back to. So this is a serious question. So now, although these figures are not understood by the general population, what I do say is we have to be very wary about making assumptions that what the European Union and the establishment out in Brussels says is good for you. And the reservations that I had in 1986 about the working of the single market has been demonstrated without my being an economist, but just simply on the basis of non-rocket science common sense and looking at figures rather than ideology, it hasn't worked the way we expected. And so I ask that question, and I'm now going to sit down, because I think there are questions you'll want to ask, uh, both of the minister and perhaps of me. But basically what I am saying is that when you move your uh, negotiations, as I wrote them down, and you said it was unusual for Japan to find itself in, engaged in questions of immigration, visas, public health, democracy, 
issues which are now being drawn into these negotiations. I simply ask the question, is this necessarily going to be such a good deal as it's made out to be? And my last comment will be that with respect to the Bertelsmann report, which you may or may not have heard of or seen, in respect of the uh, EU-US trade agreement, um, the assumptions on which some of that is based, I think, will need very careful examination. Uh, there are very powerful interests at work all over the world to try to secure benefits for themselves. This, I'm not going to use the word economic warfare, but actually want to be very careful that what is intended to be and the basis of free trade agreements from John Bright onwards in Cobden was based on improving prosperity, not gaining, to use Adam Smith's expression, I think, comparative advantage. So if we're interested in good neighborliness and we want to achieve the kind of free trade that benefits everybody, then we want to be sure that it isn't a covert form of protectionism, and we want to be sure that it does actually promote the interests of free trade and is not a covert form of protectionism. So my answer to the question, economic integration with the neighbors, a good thing, question mark, is a good idea, but does it work? Thank you very much. <laughs>
sustainable uh, growth. And what happened over the last 20 years is really a relative decline of uh, Japanese position in terms of uh, uh, economic might in the region. So how we can really come back to where uh, we used to be. So that is a very, very important uh, question. So in order to secure such uh, status and stature, uh, naturally we need uh, uh, economic development through both uh, trade expansion as well as uh, enlarging the investment. So both trade account and uh, this uh, income balance. So these could be the sources of further uh, development. So in order to achieve those, in light of the, the fact that Japan uh, went into the trade deficit position for the first time in 31 years, two years ago. So in order to do that, we need uh, a very uh, solid uh, trade liberalization uh, framework regionally. That's the main reason. And if you mention one specific country, why we want to have this regional uh, trade framework, liberalization framework, that is Korea, more than China. Yeah. So while the WTO trade negotiations were stuck in stalemate, what happened was it was Korea who concluded the bilateral <coughs> trade agreement with India, US, UK, and all of this got implemented up to two year or up to last year. So as I showed uh, you the chart. So the ratio of trade covered by effective FTAs by Korea is more than 30% now. So that's clearly the, say, say critical view shared by Japanese businessmen, particularly those who are supposed to get, uh, say, uh, profit to export. That there is a difference of terms of trade but between if I could, Japan and Korea. If I, I could put words in Bill's mouth. He might say to you, actually, what Japan should be doing is liberalizing on its own terms, mm. in its own way, and coming up with a proper third arrow. I, mean, I know uh, Abenomics is very, obviously very strong, BO, Bank of Japan action, we talked about it in previous sessions, and fiscal stimulus, but the, the so-called third arrow is still very ill-defined. Um, surely you could just liberalize markets on your own terms? I think through the negotiations of uh, those uh, important framework to like liberalization, whether that's Japan, <coughs> EU, or US, EU, or TPP, so those major uh, economic countries need to address those issues of uh, deregulation, further structural adjustment. Well, so I think that's a very, very important element which all the new countries need to work out. Yes, when we be, before we started the negotiations with the EU, yes, many of the EU countries, in particular those countries who have protectionistic <coughs> tendencies, uh, told us that you should uh, work on non-tariff barriers. So otherwise, there is a little point of having negotiations with Tokyo. So there may be some truth in it, and I don't know, but we don't call it non-tariff barriers, we call it non-tariff measures. Mm -hmm. So it depends on from which side you're looking at the same element, same phenomenon. So but uh, whether these are barriers or not. So in any case, regulatory aspects are ones which all the major <coughs> training partners need to work well uh, for the purpose of having proper benefit out of negotiations. But there is no exception. This is not only for Japan, for EU economies, US, everybody. I think they everybody on the same but otherwise we can't have high level uh, agreement for trade liberalization. Yeah, I mean I think your question is a very, very good one, which is am I actually, as it were, um, tacking into the wrong wind? In other words, is this something which uh, is a historical nostalgia, uh, or is it actually something which uh, has practical meaning? Because what we are saying in our relationship with the EU is that there are other 
uh, issues of such magnitude that we don't really believe that the, the, the claimed benefits, and I've given you the figures on that alone, business overregulation would be another one, and the impact on small and medium-sized businesses of Europe. I mean, for example, I mean, even Peter Mandelson, and I use the word even, uh, said uh, that uh, overregulation costs uh, f at least 4% of the GDP of Europe. And there's a lot of talk, every single summit, about less regulation. And I sit there in the European Scrutiny Committee, and we get another pile every week, which is that deep. And it's all about regulation. Every single thing, a thousand documents a year. And by the way, it's not just the number of documents, it's the, it's the qualitative effect, even more than the quantitative effect, of the restrictions that are imposed or the requirements that have to be followed. That's why the Federation of Small Businesses, the British Chambers of Commerce, who I had a meeting with the other day, are very, very concerned because they see no progress. If you want liberalization, it has to be on the basis not only of the external trading, but also the internal. And those who are completely determined that there will be no change in the acquis communautaire, that body of law, which is enforceable, which is virtually impossible to change, in fact is regarded as impossible to change within the framework of the European Court, actually can be nothing but a continuing burden on the businesses. And we are deeply glad of, for example, the Japanese engagement in Sunderland, for example. But that was actually a, a jumping off point for selling cars into Europe. And the problem, I suspect, I haven't got the, I don't know the management up there. But I mean, you have got these wonderful companies, and they are fantastic companies. Um, and I know because a member of my committee is a member for Sunderland. And she tells me how wonderful that the company is. But the reality is that you had hopes of selling into <coughs> Europe. And yet when you look at the, uh, manufacturing relationship between the German car makers and the Japanese and the question of growth in Europe, it's zero growth. I mean, you can't sell cars, Japanese cars, I imagine, very easily into Germany, but equally, and by the same token, the growth in Europe is about zero. And um, there is an FDI question, a foreign direct investment question, and I have people saying to me, but Bill, you know, you must just be negative about this trading business because foreign direct investment is just as important as the trade deficit. Well, I beg to differ, actually, because if the consequences of the FDI are that you actually no longer control your main utilities, you no longer control your own uh, basis of manufacture. And I was the member of parliament for Stafford for 14 years, and I saw what happened to GEC in Stafford when Siemens and Alstom moved in, and the bottom line is that it's nothing like, we had 7,000 people employed in Stafford in 1980. We now, I, well, I can't put a figure on it, but it's a private, it's more than 750 now. So the effects of foreign direct investment in the hands of companies who have a view about their own market base in their own country can be negative, although I have to say in relation to the Japanese manufacturers, you have been extremely beneficial to us in that sense. But you've got a problem now in selling into the EU, I imagine, because there is no growth. Distinctly French-sounding critique of... Uh UK well, there is an element of the go about the so, uh, about the word "no." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>